Very well, and welcome once again to Moments of Grace, this time episode 23, At the Cross with Dr. Amy Jill Levine. AJ, thank you so much for being with us. It's my pleasure to be with you again. Well, for those of you who don't know, a AJ is Rabbi Stanley M. Kessler, Distinguished Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies at Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, and professor of many uh, endowed chairs, emerita at Vanderbilt University. Um, thank you so much for being us. We were graced last week uh, to be with AJ on a Zoom uh, where she led us through a discussion of her book, Witness at the Cross. That was a wonderful time to be with you, AJ. Thank you for that. What a pleasure to be with you and with your friends and what good questions you all asked. Well, hopefully I can continue in that vein today as we think a little bit more of being at the cross. Um, and I want to use your book as a bit of a lens through that, but um, just maybe some general questions for all of us uh, to join you at the cross in the studies that you've done, um, which leads me to my first question. Um, and I, I'm just wondering, what was your inspiration and motivation for writing this particular book, um, looking at the gospels through this particular lens? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, a couple of people had written to me um, because they've read some of my other studies that I've done for Abingdon church-based studies, and they asked me if I would do something uh, directly for Holy Friday, um, and they said, well, you know, why don't you do the seven last words of Jesus? And I thought, well, first of all, there are more than seven, because he actually says a fair amount, um, and second of all, that's already been done. But I was thinking about some of the other people who were there in that scene, and since I've done a lot of work, or at least until COVID, uh, at Riverbend Maximum Security Institute, which is here in Nashville, I bring Vanderbilt students to the prison and we have, we have class inside the prison with insider students. I've been thinking a lot about the, the two men who die alongside Jesus, so that they occupy me. Uh, and when I think about Holy Friday, I wonder like, you know, who else is, who's there to support these guys? So I thought maybe we should do something about the other people who were there and perhaps we could, by looking imaginatively through their eyes, get many new perspectives on how to understand the death of Jesus um, and how to understand Jesus in the process in light of how he interacts with these people in light of how they interact with, with each other. And once I started taking a look at all four gospels and figuring out who's there and what they said, the book almost wrote itself because the gospel writers are such good writers that they help us as readers or as auditors to imagine what's happening. And as, as historians would have done at the time, they were not necessarily eyewitnesses, but they said, here's what I want our readers uh, to think about what happened. So the gospel writers basically issued the invitation and I was more than happy to accept it. I wonder if it's, if it's a fair question, because as you started talking about the seven last words, uh, kind of almost versus the witnesses at the, at the cross, I'm just wondering if it's a fair question for me to wonder, do we learn more, enter more deeply into what is going on that day through the witnesses compared to something like the seven last words? I don't understand why you'd wonder if it was a fair question or not. It seems to me that pretty much all questions are fair game. Uh, because if you if you shut down questions, you shut down the human imagination and you shut down the engagement that any individual would have with the text. And nor do I nor do I find it particularly helpful for me personally to start ranking. This is more helpful than that. Uh, it may be for some people listening to Jesus say, Father, forgive them is more helpful than anything else. On the other hand, that's only in Luke. So that's not the mes message that Mark, Matthew or John wants to convey. So it seems to me that anything that gives us purchase into insight into Jesus, insight into what the messages, the gospels are attempting to convey, insight into how these texts might help us better reflect on our own situation and our own value, all that stuff is terrific. Why rank them? In, in, in saying that, you, you've led me very nicely then into my, into my next question, and that is, how do you find each of the gospels in their own particular way? Are they choosing their witnesses in a very particular and specific way in order to convey something, or are they all kind of doing the same thing? Um, again, you ask an either or question to which the answer is probably both and, <laughs> because the study, of, the study of ancient texts, the study of ancient history, uh, the study of literatures is basically messy. Um, and there's usually a little bit of good stuff, no matter where you approach it. <clears throat> 
historians at the time, whether Jewish historians like Josephus or uh, followers of Jesus, whether Jewish or Gentile, like the evangelists or you know Greek pagans like Thucydides or Herodotus or Suetonius, um, it, they're not writing exactly what happened. They're writing to convey a message to the people who are reading their stuff. Um, that doesn't mean they're getting the history wrong, but it also means they're filling in the blanks as they intend to fill them in. Since they're not eyewitnesses, they're inventing speeches and placing those speeches on the lips of people who, whom they locate there. Uh, they're populating the scene with different people uh, about whom they think this person or this character can give us better insight into the hero, better insight into what's going on more broadly. So they're all telling a story for particular reasons. Um, the negative way of phrasing this is that they're all tendentious. The positive way of phrasing it is to say they're all like ministers who get up in the pulpit and you have a certain text and then, and then you tell the congregation certain things about the text and you ignore other things and you spin it in certain ways. So we can look at them as like they're pastors or rabbis saying, here's the message you ought to get out of X event today. Here's how you should understand the Exodus. Here's how you should understand the Davidic monarchy. Here's how you should understand the creation of the world. And in this case, here's how you should understand the death of Jesus. They've all got different concerns. They all highlight different issues. They've all got different people at the cross. And the smart thing that the church did, the, the early church did many smart things. One of the smartest things was to give us four different perspectives here. In the same way we have two different perspectives on creation in Genesis 1 and then in Genesis 2 and 3. We have different perspectives on King David from 1st and 2nd Samuel and, and, and then moving on to 1st and 2nd Chronicles. So the church said there's no one way to encapsulate what's going on. There's no one way to encapsulate the theological message, the ethical message, the political message, the stories about the women. So we're going to give you four versions and then say, you all read this, and then you will come up with a multiple new interpretations of your own. It's all good. Would it be easy, simple to give a summary? What, what are the witnesses in Mark saying to us in a sentence or two, and then Matthew, Luke, and John, and uh, their similarities and differences? Sure. Well, let, let's just hit one or two of the highlights. And to do the rest, you know, read the book. Um, so Mark, Mark's theme uh, throughout the gospel is Jesus is the suffering Messiah who was misunderstood by many people. The only people who seem to know who he is are the demons, and they don't want to have anything to do with him. Uh, uh, and there's a tragedy to the gospel of Mark. Uh, when John the Baptist dies, his disciples come and they claim the body. When Jesus dies in the gospel of Mark, Mark tells us his, at Gethsemane, the disciples forsook him and fled. The last time we see Peter, he's denying Jesus three times and then breaks down when he hears the rooster crow. Um, he's got women following him from Galilee, but Mark says they're at a distance. So the only people who are close to him when he dies are the soldiers who were mocking him and casting lots for his garments. Um, uh, the other two men who were crucified next to him, they also mock, mock him. Um, and he dies with what's called the cry of dereliction on his lips from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then you realize, well, you're there too because you're a reader. And are you doing what those characters in the text could not do? Are you becoming the faithful disciples? And then suddenly you realize that God is there too, because that's what the rending of the temple veil is, as a sign of mourning or an opening between heaven and earth. Um, that's what nature is doing, because nature is bearing witness as well, because there's darkness there. And then your job for Mark, Mark ends with a bunch of scared women fleeing an empty tomb. Your job is to say, wait a minute, that's not the end of the story. And Mark basically says, okay, you reader, you take it to the next level. You go proclaim the resurrection and you do what the disciples could not do. Uh, Matthew changes this. Matthew uh, reinforces earthquakes and, and signs and wonders at the cross. So that whereas in the gospel of Mark, the soldier who looks at Jesus when he dies and says, surely this man was a son of God, which in Mark could have been read as surely this man was a son of God. Like, are you kidding uh, for Matthew, the statement cannot possibly be sarcastic because the soldiers saw the signs and wonders and they realized, ah, oh, there's something special here. Uh, Matthew, and only Matthew, locates Mrs. Zebedee, the mother of James and John at the cross, um, but she's not at the tomb. So you kind of wonder, did she go back to Galilee to get the guys together with the program? And in Matthew's gospel, uh, there's, there's not so much tragedy because at the empty tomb, uh, the women then encounter the risen Jesus who commissions them to go tell the, the male apostles that he is going before them into Galilee. Luke gives us 
And only in Luke, the father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And then we can try to determine about whom is he speaking? Is he speaking about the soldiers who were in the process of torturing him to death? Um, is he speaking about the balkers and the bystanders who, who, who don't understand who he is? Is he talking about the so-called bad thief who says, well, you know, if you're the son of God, get us down from here, which is a really logical thing to say under the circumstance. Is he talking about all humanity? And here we have the two thieves, one of whom says, you know, if you're really who they say you are, well, get yourself out of this mess and get us out of it, save us, without realizing that by dying, Jesus is in fact not only saving him, but saving everybody else. Um, but then you also have this, this so-called good thief, who is the only person in the text who seems to recognize that Jesus has a kingdom, because he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus changes the language a little bit and says, today you will be with me in paradise. Um, since he's not baptized, he hasn't actually confessed his sin. He admitted he did something wrong, uh, but he doesn't say, gee, I'm really sorry that I did it. So it, what Luke ha helps us do is complicate the sense of who's saved and how is one saved. And in John, Jesus controls everything. Jesus carries his own cross. Simon of Cyrene is not in John. Um, there's no way in John Jesus would have said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus and the Father are so tight um, as John, as Jesus puts it in John, the father and I are one. There's no possible way he feels bereft of anything. And then Jesus calmly in the process of dying, looks at his mother who only in the gospel of John is at the foot of the cross and the beloved disciple who only in John is at the foot of the cross and, and entrust them to each other as if, as if he's setting up a new family unit. Um, and then Jesus decides exactly when he is going to die. He chooses the moment. Um, so very, very different images of Jesus, different people at the cross, different forms of conversation, sometimes the same story told differently. In Matthew, uh, we have the centurion at the cross hailing Jesus as son of God. In Mark, we have that same centurion with the same line, but with different events happening, perhaps being sarcastic. Luke has the centurion there as well, but he says, surely this man was righteous, sometimes translated innocent, because Luke has a huge concern for making sure that everybody who reads this text knows that Jesus is not guilty of anything. Pilate proclaims him innocent three times, Herod. Antipas proclaims him innocent. The other thief proclaims him innocent. He says, this, this man speaking of Jesus did nothing out of place, right? Um, and then the centurion proclaims him innocent. And there's no centurion at John. Instead, you have a soldier only in John who pierces Jesus' side with a spear and then blood and water comes out. Um, well, that's, that's kind of how you get saved. It's water of baptism, it's blood of Eucharist. It's also a parturition image, it's a birth imagery, um, as if Jesus here on the cross is giving birth to the church. So John has, and that's not the only example in John, it's fabulous symbolism. So that if you read all of the gospel of John up to chapter 19, pretty much every word will remind you of some other word that had been spoken before. And then you go back and you read it retrospectively. Now that you know what happened at the cross, go back and look at chapter one, go back and look at chapter four, and you see so much more. I think what's what's so important about the book you've written and what you've just done there is taking us slowly through each of these four different tellings because we read them so quickly sometimes that we miss things. Mm -hmm. And you highlighted something that last week that I had never realized before. And I wonder if you could speak to it briefly now once again. And that is in Luke's gospel, Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. And you spoke about that the fact that Jesus, whom you said uh, forgave earlier in the Gospels, why is he not forgiving now? Could you speak to that again? Because I found that to be really deep. Sure. Um, I, I, and I want to give credit here, as I did earlier, to my former student, Maria Mayo, who is actually now my editor for the Abingdon series. So if you buy the book, you'll, I think you'll see her name in the credits somewhere. Um, Maria was a graduate student of mine in a doctoral seminar on the Gospel of Luke. Um, and Maria had said to me at as we were reading that narrative, why does Jesus say, Father, forgive them? I thought that was a great question. It never occurred to me either. So I did what any self-respected PhD seminar leader would do. I said, I don't know, go write a paper. Um, and eventually she enters into the PhD program at Vanderbilt and she wrote a dissertation of, on this, um, which was originally published by Fortress Press. It's called The Limits of Forgiveness. Um, and she's now republished the same book uh, with Wiffenstock. So it's been republished, The Limits of Forgiveness. And what she did in a not only a rigorous kind of academic New Testament studies model, looking at the Greek and so on, she also looked at how forgiveness functioned in the, in the broader classical world. 
uh, and she used test cases of victim offender mediation in the criminal justice system and uh, uh, counseling for victims of domestic abuse uh, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, three, three social movements that drive toward forgiveness as if the only way forward if you've been abused, um, if you've been a crime victim, uh, if the police state in South Africa came after you, the only way to, to heal is to forgive. And Maria pushed back on that and said, there should be some alternative. You, you can be a crime victim. Nothing says you have to forgive the person who attacked you or attacked a member of your family in order to be healthy and whole. Sometimes not having anything to do with this person is fine. And if you think forgiveness is of ultimate value, then say, Father, forgive them because I can't, and I'm not in the position to do that. So when she comes back to the Gospel of Luke, she can say, Jesus gives permission to people who have been dreadfully hurt, and there are a few things more dreadful than dying by crucifixion, who have been dreadfully hurt, who cannot bring themselves to say, that's it, fine, I forgive you, because you did something so horrible to me but allow that forgiveness to be there, but here by a third party. And I thought that was pastorally profound. Um, and you know, if you were to say to Luke, Luke, did you intend this? I'm not sure, but I think it's a very, very good reading. And I think you know, a very, very good reading to help a lot of us who do struggle with particular events or people in our lives, which are just difficult to forgive um, and, and indeed to possibly be forgiven for as well. Um, so I think that does speak very deeply and profoundly. Um, my last question, um, since we're all supposed to be there at the cross through these witnesses, I just wonder if there is one witness or maybe one group of witnesses, uh, which through your study here and writing it, uh, spoke most profoundly to you um, and to what's going on that day. Um, it, it changes from the time I started thinking about the book to the time I started writing the book to now that I've been doing a couple of programs with, you know, congregations such as yours that, that want to speak with me about this. Um, I've been thinking a whole lot more about those daughters of Jerusalem. Um, and the reason I've been thinking about them is because of what's going on right now in Ukraine um, with pictures of mothers with children. Um, when Jesus says, uh, you know, don't weep, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves and for your children, you know, because the days are coming when you'd wish you would never have been pregnant in the first place. Um, and, and that visceral sense of this is what it means to live under occupation. Um, this is what it means to live in a situation where you cannot trust um, so-called Roman justice, because there is no such thing. Um, this is what it means that when you die to recognize that you're not dying alone. And Luke says, let's focus. Jesus says, don't just focus on me. There are other people who are going to die and are their deaths going to be noted? And then we get to those other two thieves at the cross who, as I mentioned, have always occupied me. Um, so I wonder about, you know, did they have family and friends at the cross? Who cared about their bodies when they died? Um, uh, did they have children? Did they have memories? What crimes did they commit uh, such that one of them could say, we deserve what we're getting? Who deserves to be tortured to death? Who deserves to be put to death? Um, so particularly from Luke's version, I, I, I keep looking at it and saying, boy, that it, it's ancient history, as Luke would tell it. And Luke is a very good storyteller. But it's still today. So I keep looking at these texts, and I keep reflecting on what I just read in the newspaper. Um, and the text, the, the gospel text, helped me better to assess my own values, uh, to assess sometimes my own feelings. I really, you know, somebody's going to bomb a town. Well, kill all those soldiers. And I think, no, 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 Jesus doesn't let me do that. The Jewish tradition doesn't let me do that. Back up a little bit. There's an old rabbinic comment um, about a rabbi who was just so annoyed at people doing evil in his neighborhood. And he basically just said, I, in effect, I, I, I wish we would all drop dead. And his wife was very, very smart. Her name is Berea Responds. Um, the Psalm says, we don't wish for the death of individuals, you wish for the death of sin. And I think Luke comes around there with that same general message. Thank you for that. And I mean, and I had never realized it before either, but um, Simon of Cyrene, um, speaking today of refugees as well, I had, I had never seen him in that light before. And so it's just the beauty and the power of this story now speaking centuries and centuries later, but as, as you very well noted, that different witnesses will speak to each and every one of us at different times and in different contexts. And I think that is, you know, the power and the beauty of, of having them all in their own particular ways, in their own particular gospels as well. 
the Simon model gives us a sense of how the gospels um, speak into the future. Um, and I don't think that the gospel writers would have known how prescient they were in speaking into the future. So when I get a geographical reference in the Bible, like Arimathea or Cyrene, um, I want to know where these places are, right? So Cyrene is Libya, um, and that means you know Tripoli or Benghazi. I mean, as we think about places in Libya, um, in the first century, this is in North Africa, there was a huge Jewish population in Libya, right? Part of the Jewish diaspora. Today, there are no Jews in Libya, none, um, because they got rid of their Jewish population. Uh, the Nazis, uh, and then uh, kind of hardcore Islamic rule, which made life extremely difficult for Jews. So they're, they're gone. And this lets me wonder about where are all those communities that used to be there that aren't there anymore? Um, where do they find refuge? Um, did Simon find refuge as many other diaspora Jews did then and now um, in the state of Israel? Where are people who are now being bombed going to find refuge and who's going to take them in? And again, the text speaks into the future, even though it probably did not intend to do so. The words of the gospels will always outstrip the, the intent of the authors. Interesting. Thank you so much for being with us again. I wanna give you a chance to say anything you want at the end as we close. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty generous. It um, is. Yeah, thank you. I don't always get that. Um, it, so, Let's go back to your early comments about, is it fair to ask, or is it this rather than that? Just to say anything is fair to ask. Um, and there's no reason to rank moments of inspiration or moments of profound ethical teaching. Uh, because once you start ranking, you lock stuff in place. So in effect, the gospels refuse to allow you to do that. It's like saying, is John more important than Mark? Well, not necessarily. <laughs> Um, is Luke more important than Mark? Because Luke probably used Mark as a source, you know, so did Matthew. Why worry about that? Begin by saying, what does this text mean to me at this particular moment of my life? And if you get a message, that's terrific. And if you read a text when you're six, and you read the same text when you're 60, and you get exactly the same message, go read it again. Because these texts weren't written for children. So go read it again, because the text will always have new messages if you just read them closely enough. Thank you so much once again. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and I dare say, I hope we're able to see you again very soon. Oh, from your mouth to God's ears, absolutely. Thank you, AJ.